Good evening. You are listening to a Rattledge and Broadcasting premier podcast TV party tonight. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And tonight, we are reviewing a very special AEW Dynamite episode, Holiday Bash. And here to review the show with me, riding up on his horse, is fellow podsman Chris Bailey. How do you do, sir? Oh, I am doing super well. It is Boxing Day here in Canada. And, of course, there's not a flake of snow to be seen, which is really unusual for Canada, by the way. So I'm doing this podcast outdoors shirtless and i will still will tell the listening audience that i look better than chris jericho so there you go <laughs> we talked about this <laughs> offline but um so i guess this episode of dynamite aired at 10 o'clock when the nba game was over and i yep. guess people like didn't get off their couch or, or change the channel after the nba game was over just kept watching they're like oh wrestling i and and i guess these are people who have not been following the product for a decade so they uh, they just saw wrestling on. They were like, oh, what's happening here? Oh, that's Chris Jericho. I remember him from the Attitude Era. And oh, my God, he's fat. <laughs> <laughs> and instantly, workout programs sold around the world because people <laughs> who were stuck on their couch were like, fuck this. <laughs> I don't want to look like that. Basketball Twitter roasting Chris Jericho might be the best Christmas gift I've been given this year. Oh, man. It was a skewering. Boy, was uh, was Twitter a flutter, Mark Radlich, with, the, <laughs> with poor Jericho's build everywhere. And, I mean, these guys must have done, like, millions of screen caps because, man, they managed to capture this guy looking at his all-time worst. Man. There, there's no way they're testing for drugs in AEW. None. There's no reason for Jericho not to get on the gas right now. Oh no 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 no! He needs uh, he needs the Ico Pro brother right away. <laughs> he needs Ico Pro. He needs HGH. He needs MGM. He needs it all. It doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly right. All right. All right. So we started off with Fat Chris Jericho and Steve and Jake Hager in a tag team match because we're, we're we're back to that again. Remember when a few weeks ago. Uh, Chris Jericho said, my focus is on being a tag team with Jake Hager and getting the tag team titles. And then, but Squirrel! He's, MJF. he's here with MJF right now. That He actually tagged with MJF. Oh, with right. Jake Hager in his corner. Okay, but my st- my point still stands. Remember when that was their thing? Because this was only a few weeks ago. Chris Jericho and Jake Hager were, were the tag team. And then, Squirrel! Again. And then he was like, <laughs> I'm in the thing with MJF now. This is... Yep. <laughs> the AEW written on attention deficit disorder <laughs> they clearly lost the original script from a couple weeks ago because uh, <laughs> they they transitioned well right into mjf here which which makes me wonder where in the heck were they going with jericho and hager like it, it didn't seem to be going anywhere considering... the natural conclusion would have been to eventually put them against the young bucks but back so well let me ask you a question what do you think of these top flight guys does darius martin and dante martin much like warhorse since neither of these people wrestle in death matches, I don't know who they are, but I guess they're big in the indies, which is what this company seems to excel at, is plucking obscurity from the indies and putting them directly on television without the benefit of uh, training them for TV the way the WWE does with their NXT program and their uh, ca- and their performance center. So it's like, you know, we were just wrestling in a barn last week. Terrific. Apparently you're really popular. <laughs> Let's put you right on television. Um, so that's that's my thing. What is your thing with Top Flight? So Top Flight, if if you watch Dark, and I watch Dark pretty consistently, uh, Top Flight is it, this is not a new team. I mean, they've been around for several months on Dark. Okay, you know, having these guest spots, but they were introduced to the big league on Dynamite against the Young Bucks in a tag team match, and you know what? These guys. There's something there, man. There's there's some there's some little bit of magic. They got to refine their look and get a little bit more aggressive looking. I think. But uh, definitely the talent is there. They remind me of a young Hardy Boys. I don't know, and they, because uh, man, they. I gotta tell you, during the during the match with the Young Bucks, 
I think that they brought the Young Bucks up a level trying to keep up with Top Flight because I think there is there's definitely some magic here. And when they introduced their package, they actually showed all their independent highlights, and they've got some great new moves and lots of innovation here. So, I think we got I think we got a top literally a top flight talent here. So, I'm I'm excited. So, this is going to be my my one old man rant on this entire review. But I they look like babies. Yeah, and that's what I said. Their look, their look is not their hair. <laughs> they, they I, just... I wish they kept the hoodie zippered up over their face. <laughs> yeah, but they keep the masks on. <laughs> um, no, they just look like babies. They look so young, and you know. And I remember like when I was a kid, because the people that were in the WWE were refined wrestlers from the territories who were in their thirties. You know, they, they they were in the prime of their wrestling careers, which is your thirties. You know, you spend your twenties learning your craft, refining the art, getting, you know, getting your calluses, essentially, like a musician. And then you get into your late 20s, early 30s, and you're in your prime. You're yep. old enough to look like grown men, but still young enough that you don't hurt yourself doing a drop kick. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are still reckless, I will say that. There were mm. some moves with the, especially the Young Bucks match, where you're just like, dude, you cannot continue to do move like I'll tell you what when you're on the top rope and you're preparing to do a move and one of your opponents rushes you and just shoves you backwards you know <laughs> off off the top rope and off the you know the top pillar onto the floor that's that's you know that doesn't bode well for a long career let's put it that way there was a uh, I went to an indie show in New York City many many years ago and I remember there was this one wrestler like my friends had all the friends that I went with at the time had all gone to this show before and were familiar with these guys and this was at a time where Eddie Guerrero was headlining. He was on the outs with the WWE and he was headlining this indie show in New York City and there was this one wrestler on the card who I guess was really young like he might have only been like 18 or 19 but the gag among the fans was that he was still in school and he was still like a teenager uh. so he would do a move he he would get in and, and he and he got beat up a lot in these wrestling matches like he took, he was the underdog fighting from underneath taking a beating you know he was the spark you know the plucky underdog and um everyone would yell out don't hurt him he's got homework <laughs> he's got he's got school in the morning oh, <laughs> the, the whole match and oh, when I look terrible. at Top Flight, that's what I see. I, 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 there, like, how do how do the how do you make the young bucks look old? You oh know, boy, you by know comparison. what they did? They looked they looked like worn out leather, like the New Day. <laughs> <laughs> Which I will not give up on, by the way, because man, I'm telling you, the New Day look like <laughs> look like dried leather. I'm telling you, there's something just <laughs> something happening here with those two guys. So Top Flight versus Jericho and MJF. Um, you know, Top Flight, you know, their thing is going 100 miles an hour and doing a lot of flippity doos and they're in there with old fat Jericho and the and the guy that most resembles what I was just referring to in being at the peak of your career, MJF. Yes. Uh, what did you think of this match? So, it was interesting because, you know, obviously you had one team that is fairly grounded. MJF is not what you consider a high flyer, even though he's got a little bit of high flying in his arsenal. Jericho, surprisingly still in this shape, is still doing the lion salt and different things like that. So, I mean, amazingly, he's still got a lot of his repertoire that seems to be transferred over to Fat Jericho. He, even in, despite his shell, despite his shape, he can still go. And uh, they pulled a classic tag team match. So they were doing the old, you know, start and stop heel moves of like the, you know, tag teams of the 80s against these young high flyers. So basically, Jericho and MJF were, you know, selling a couple drop kicks and selling a couple flippity doos. And they were, you know, doing the pull them out to the outside, doing the, the heel start and stop type of thing. So, you know, it's, it's basically a nuts and bolts high flyer versus technician type match. So, you know, it was perfectly fine, entertaining way to start the show. And you got Jericho you know, let's jump on to start your show. So, I mean, you know, anyone who was just coming off that basketball game, I think they would have stuck with it for a few minutes. So I think the, uh, the objective was served here. Um, this bled into Hager, who got the win for them when he uh, smashed Dante on the apron and then MGF landed the heat seeker on Darius for the win. Hager, who they generally don't give a mic to because he's terrible, uh, threw a tantrum about Wardlow not being 
uh, not being present for Dynamite. So he demanded from Tony Khan that him and Wardlow would have a big man Godzilla versus King Kong type match next uh, for the first of two New Year's bashes Dynamite. Do you think that they did a good job building up Jake Hager as like a monster? I know the Wardlow has been done so you know what i mean like they've yeah. really put him over as the diesel the heavy you know what i mean mm-hmm. but have they done that with hager he just seems like the you know the guy who sits in the background in the inner circle i don't think that they've done enough to convince me that he's a big monster to face the wardlow despite his size you know what i mean he's sort of like you know that soft hot pocket type of guy i don't know i'm just yeah, not convinced that this is a collision no and that's that's the problem with the whole inner circle is that they can't seem to figure out how to make the inner circle work um, everyone has their assigned role. Jericho was the leader. Sammy yep. Guevara was the cruiserweight, you know, who's supposed to take uh, take pins for Jericho. Jake Hager was supposed to be that the uh, the heater to you know get Jericho cheating wins. Right? He's supposed to do what he did in this match. He's supposed to interfere from the apron, and you know, and Jericho gets a cheating win. And then you have. Uh, pa- Santana and Ortiz, who are supposed to be your tag team. That's it. This isn't that hard. And they keep getting people... Like, no, there's no consistency. And I think that's what I was talking about at the top of this podcast with AEW and the storytelling. There's no consistency from one episode to the next. Um, later on, when we get to what in the hell happened with uh, Eddie Kingston's group... Like, I can't follow, and I watch the show every week. Like, this is the one... Like, this and NXT, I watch consistently every week. I DVR them, and I watch them the next day. And I'm paying attention, and I'm like, I can't follow the story. Like, like I, it, I completely agree. The Eddie Kingston thing has me blown away. I haven't... I, I can't, for the life of me, decipher that code, but... Yeah, right. so, I just, you know, they... they they didn't get they in the beginning they had Hager doing that then they kind of abandoned it and then they went in this other direction and then he's just kind of there. Um they gave him a couple of matches like he wrestled Dustin Rhodes in a match that was mostly forgettable and like they've had him wrestle hither and thither but I don't get the sense that he's a monster like he needs to, like if you you need an example of how to book a monster to at least where you believe that they that they have Herculean strength and you can kill anyone that they get in the ring with Braun Strowman now, Braun Strowman may suck, but I believe he's a monster. You know oh, what I'm I saying? Well. Absolutely. They built him so as a monster, even though his back is, you know, on the mat more times than it's not. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I guarantee you, you, you get monster as soon as you see Strowman. When I see Hager, I just see, you know, lazy-ass, you know, mid-card WWE guy. And it's a, it's a shame because I think the guy has some talent there. But it still hasn't been found here in AEW, and they're and they're pretty well, they're pretty decent at finding talent in recycled trash. So, yeah, he's a dude. Speaking of recycled trash, what happened to Brody? Uh, what happened to Brody? What Brody? Who Brody? What's his face? Um, the inner circle, not the inner circle. Jesus Christ, Dark Order, dude, the Exalted. Oh my God. Yeah, I don't know what in the blue hell happened there. I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> it seems like the Dark Order is this is this. Uh, you talk about an inconsistent booking party. I mean, you got Evil Uno, who's basically running it here right now, with no explanation of where Brody Lee went. I mean, injured after, you know, his match with Cody Rhodes. That's the only thing that storyline sense makes any sense. But, man, I... You know, they're they're trying to recruit Dustin Runnels or Dustin Rhodes. I, I, I don't know where we're going here, but I think what's happening with the inconsistent booking... WWE is great at this. So, say if something happens like a curveball, so somebody gets injured... It's like the writers are stuck in the forbidden zone. They have no idea where to go. They're stuck in the phantom zone. They can't write their way out, and they're frozen with the pen. They're like, uh, what do we do? I know. Let's get Jake Hager to fill in that spot. And you're like, no. I use, you know I, what I mean? It doesn't yeah, no, sense. absolutely. I use, and I use this um, analogy a lot, but if you'll remember, there was a Daffy Duck cartoon. He was trying to pitch a screenplay, and yes. it's the Scarlet uh, Pumpernickel. And at the end, he doesn't have an ending, so he's just like, and then the dam broke. Um, and, <laughs> like he's just throwing ideas in in there. Like he has no idea how to end the script. And they're like, "Is that all?" And that's kind of AEW. They like they they write themselves into kind of a corner with no natural conclusion or any conclusion. And then they're like, you know, and <laughs> but then the cavalry came, but it was too late. And then the dam <laughs> broke. And then a fire started. You know, they it's like they just kind of keep going, and and it like fizzles out. And then, like I said, squirrel, and they change direction entirely. 
Well, I mean, they did it with Brandy, Brandy Rhodes, for example. I mean, you know, they have this brand new girl who came in out of nowhere and was going to stomp a mud hole in her, and, you know, they're going to get in that big feud with Shaq and the whole nine yards. Now, all of a sudden, Brandy's pregnant, and that whole thing is scrapped. (laughs) Well, you you can't help it when you're pregnant. I mean, I'd like to hold that against her, but I can't. Um, You know, it it happens. No, no, but if you're pregnant, then you get Mm -hmm. somebody else to fill in your spot. And I assume this is where they're going. You know what I mean? Okay, you know, Brandy is going to lead somebody else to take out this person. And then, you know, they'll get together once the pregnancy deal is over. What the hell happened to Awesome Kong? Brother, this this entire... (laughs) You talk... So the Nightmare family... The whole concept and idea of this nightmare family and the nightmare collective and all these different parts of the puzzle, if you had to piece this together chronologically, it would blow your mind. It makes no sense. So Brandy (laughs) comes in. She starts with Cody Rhodes by him side. She's a face, almost like a, you know, a GM type manager type thing for AEW. All of a sudden, she goes crazy. She turns heel. She gets together this nightmare collective of awesome Kong and some weirdos at ringside. That literally gets aborted immediately. She goes right back to being a good guy, right back in Cody's corner. Now she's pregnant, right in the middle of another feud. It's just like they have no idea how to book on the fly, and this is the thing. They got this storyline in mind, a good linear conclusion, and it just takes all these deviations, and they just forget it. They literally just throw away the nuts and bolts and throw away the script, and we're just going to start over. Hey, she's pregnant? Good, perfect. That's (laughs) that's where we're going. (laughs) The dam broke. And then, then the dam broke. Is it weird that Jade Cargill is the most interesting thing on on uh, Dynamite these days? Oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of which, uh, Tony Schiavone interviewed Sting, Old oh, Man wait, Winter. Wait, wait, wait. Ready? Yes. Sting! There you go. Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. So, That'll Old Man it. Winter comes out, and he says he's back in the... He <laughs> runs through his repertoire of hits, that he's back in the jungle... Yep. Um, he's happy to be here. And then uh, Shoney asked, like, well, why are you here? And then um, Darby Al- they pointed that Darby Allen was in the audience. And Sting mentions Dusty Rhodes and recalled when he watched matches with him backstage while he waited for his first break. He did a Dusty impression and explained how Dusty told him they were going to color his face in his tights and have him work with Ric Flair and get funky like a monkey, if you will. <laughs> So, okay, think about this. Now, you were a big fan of uh, WCW, NWO era, correct? You loved Nitro, did you not? Sure. Uh, let's, let's just say, you know, okay, the sting in the audience thing, you, 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 had to, you had to agree that was great. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. big payoff when he came down from that ceiling and kicked the crap out of him with the baseball bat. Those arenas would erupt. Yeah. Is anyone, <laughs> does anyone think that if there was a big schmoz in the middle of that ring and Darby Allen comes rolling out on his skateboard that that place is going to clear? No, sir. They're going to beat the shit out of that little hippie, and he's done. <laughs> Skateboard up the ass and out of the ring. So I don't know what we're getting out of the, you know, they're trying to do the whole Sting thing where, you know, this guy is hanging out. What is he going to do? Darby Allen. he's sitting in the audience watching on Sting, and, you know, what is the game here? I tell you what the game is. There's no game because we're <laughs> there's not going to be any logical conclusion to this Can other I... than Sting is going to somewhat adopt Darby Allen as his little, you know, mentor type thing. That's it. Here's the thing, though. The connection between Sting and Darby Allen can only have been imagined by a four-year-old because the only similarity between them is they both have face paint on. Sting, yes. Sting wore face paint. You know, he, came, he was a Blade Runner and he wore face paint. That, like, Sting and Warrior came out of the power and paint era right Ooh. they were doing their take on a lot of wrestlers the most famous being the road warriors that yes. painted that that were huge and muscular and painted their fate and everybody looked like they came out of mad max right? yes exactly right okay so then you know so so the, to keep the face paint would have made sense in wc you know when he came to you know, out of world class and into WCW. That he was doing a surfer thing. It was the, you know, late 80s, early 90s, you know, the, the beach bum surfer thing. That all, that's all fine. It's all, it's, it's fine. Um, and then, you know, so he was the classic white meat baby face that it took on the dastardly Ric Flair and all of these different feuds and whatnot. You know, he was the Hulk Hogan of that, of that bit of, uh, exactly. Crockett slash NWA slash WCW history. And as I said in a previous podcast, 
all of a sudden, for no reason in Sting's mind, nobody trusted him anymore. And they were fooled by a guy who was a full foot shorter than him and wider. Right. And who was dressed up as Sting. And so everyone's like, clearly you're a bad guy now. And he got pissed, went dark, became the Punisher, and started hitting people with bats. <laughs> that was Sting. Yes. What does but... the hell? What does that have anything to do with Darby Allen, who's a skateboarder into self mutilation? No, you're you're exactly right. And what made Sting work back in the day? Uh, you came from Crockett. Now Crockett was about as straight laced of a wrestling promotion as you could possibly think of, and they inherited a smaller company like WWE is used to doing right now, the UWF. With that, they got Sting. Now this guy is a young, brash, he's vibrant, and he turn, He starts out as a heel. He was every man's nightmare sting. But the fans started to dig the guy, you know what I mean? He was he was a ball of energy. He was all about excitement. He had the yelling. He was jacked. I mean, Sting was a big dude, Mark. I'm telling you right now. But he had that electricity behind him, and he was different. Is Darby Allen different and exciting or any, or, or or even big, larger than life. Does he have any of the Sting attributes? He has none of that. You know what I mean? He's the, right. the he's the depressed kid who's going to shoot himself in the head. You know what I mean? This is that's what this guy is. So I, I if, don't I don't understand. If they could get away with it, he'd wear a trench coat and carry a machine gun, and blow the and shoot all five people in the audience. He would. That would be his gimmick. Yeah, Colum, Columbine kid. Exactly. If if in a different world where you can get away with doing something with doing something like that, he would absolutely be the Columbine kid. What the fuck That's does terrible. that have to do with Sting? <laughs> they do, need both face paint. Like Sting is cold. He's into winter. He does. <laughs> winter is coming. Mark. Okay. Maybe that's all that, I can tell you. Maybe that's it. The, the 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 similarity between them is seasonal depression. <laughs> Bingo! There it is. We found the missing link right there. There we go. All depression. right. Podcast over. Um. <laughs> All right, so then he said when he saw Cody Rhodes leading the charge in AEW, he wanted to be a part of it, and he starts to talk about Darby Allen, and out comes the second-best promo in all of AEW, fucking Taz. I like Taz. Taz is a bright spot on my screen, and I yeah. love it. And you know what? He, he really has fire on the mic. Like, I think that he is invested in this character, and it's some of the best stuff Taz has done in, in years since his podcast. I mean, he's spitting venom at these guys. I don't know. I don't know if you can read between the lines with some of his taunts and some of his quips that he has on that mic. But uh, he he's shooting straight on a lot of this stuff, man. I'm telling you. So they basically threaten to beat the shit out of Sting, which is what this yes. group does. By the way, other than Eddie Kingston and and it's like kind of equal for me because Eddie Kingston's group and Taz's group are like my two favorite parts of Dynamite. Except that Taz's group makes sense, and Eddie Kingston's group <laughs> seems to change from week to week. <laughs> with no explanation whatsoever <laughs> other than the dam broke. That's the only explanation. Yeah. Um, anyway, so Taz is like, we're going to kick Sting's ass. We're, you know, another old guy stealing the spotlight from the young, hungry guys. You, you know, they, they and they're absolutely right. They're like, you're like 100 years old. You're going to get your ass kicked. And they go oh, to yeah. do that. And they are run off by all 90 pounds of Darby Allen, which... <laughs> In defense of Darby Allen, when he's actually wrestling and he's like the plucky underdog, like I was talking about before, you know, and, and he can somehow fight from underneath, I like that. And I like his, and I think he has an interesting look. And I think in a, yeah. with a, in a more creative place, they could actually do something interesting with the fact that he's disaffected and disillusioned and hates life and is depressed and hurts himself. Like, there's something there. There's something genuinely there to play with, especially in the culture today. This country doesn't under this this company rather doesn't understand Darby Allen. They just they look at him and they think they they understand him, but they're misusing him completely. Anyway, all hundred all, all ninety pounds of Darby Allen ran off Taz and his group. Okay, I want you to think about this. Let's respect AEW continuity for a second, okay? Mm -hmm. Remember, let's flash back to one of their battle royals when Darby Allen was rolled up in a body bag <laughs> by Brian Cage, who's of Team Taz, so this all relates back, and literally hurled lifelessly <laughs> over the top <laughs> rope to a rampway to his demise. So right. The ri so it, it, it baffles me why why these guys run. I mean, you got Powerhouse Hobbs, which is the biggest dick, stupid character that I've seen in a long time, and all the Taz characters. 
and they're running from this guy who they basically dude, killed with team, one dude. Team Taz, you have a got you have this like muscular weightlifter dude. You have this power uh, uh, power lifter dude, and you have Ricky Starks who looks like a million dollars. He does. Any one of them should be able to kick Darby's ass. Any one of them should be able to kick Darby's ass and Sting's ass. And they <laughs> yeah, ran like, away. He, should, he shouldn't have got past, past Ricky Sparks or Ricky Starks or whatever. <laughs> they should not have gotten past him, let alone Brian Cage or Powerhouse Hobbs. They, they all have, they have main event him. looks. Ricky Starks looks like a million dollars. Okay, Brian Cage He's is like... On the mic. If He's someone like, like, what does a wrestler look like? They look like Brian Cage, or at least they're supposed yep. to. And Powerhouse yes. Hobbs looks like he walked out of fucking Mid South. Yep. Yeah, big time. Absolutely, he does, man. He's 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 a monster <laughs> of a goon. My God, he is the Mississippi, you know, heavyweight champion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to think of that comment, but that's hilarious. <laughs> You're right. Um, Bill, I said Bill Watts would have been in love with him. He'd have been, he'd have run that territory. Well, they would have done an angle where someone stole his cornbread. You know, they would have. Yes, they, yes, sir. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, so Taz says we're going to take the high road and we'll fight another day, and they just leave. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, MJF was shown outside of a room marked for dining that contained Santana and Ortiz. He heard what happened to Santana and that he lost someone close to him. MJF revealed that he recently lost his grandfather to cancer. <laughs> And he said he knows how hard it is, and then he's there for him. Santana told him to keep his head up, and they shared a, a bro hug. Ortiz then shook his hand. Yeah, that was so. So basically, what's going on here? They're stirring the pot. So MJF is trying to, you know, acclimate himself with the rest of the inner circle. So basically, he what he wants to do is displace Jericho as the leader. So he's working every angle he can with all the stuff. So here. You know, Santana and Ortiz. Only one guy, you know, believed that he was worth being in the group. The other guy was hesitant. So he won both of them over here now. So he's slowly weaseling his way in through. You know, he's the infection getting into the body. You know what I mean? And we saw this years ago. I mean, when, you know, when The Rock basically took over the nation of domination. It's it's an old, old wrestling trope. You know what I mean? But um, they're slowly building it here. And, and hopefully they can keep their writing enough together to actually make this happen and displace Jericho. Because Jericho, I think, is is going to end up on his own eventually he's just got to build this team underneath him right now so he's in building character creating mode so that's what he's doing here yeah he's going to be alone like the ghost of christmas present surrounded by food <laughs> that's not a good thing <laughs> um, speaking of food the dark order <laughs> <laughs> sort of, now i just want to see jericho sitting in the corner with a wreath on his head oh the chocolate pot roast all right um <laughs> The Dark Order's Colt Cabana, 5 and 10, versus the Jurassic Express. Uh, what did you think of this match? So, Jurassic Express, you talk about a team... Like, I like that Jurassic Express one. They moved on to the next next week and all that type of stuff. Uh, Dark Order, you know, slot fillers here, you know, 5 and 10. They're still doing the Colt Cabana angle, which, which I don't think they've done anything with this angle. So, Colt Cabana basically was, you know not bribed, but sort of wooed into the Dark Order. He didn't want to do it at first, but he was on a losing streak, so they, you know, they brought to see him into the light, and I think the whole idea was to split Cabana off, you know, after a while, but again, like everything else in wrestling, things fall through the cracks, and Colt Cabana is literally Dark Order for life right now, so that's interesting, but Jungle Boy Luchasaurus and Marco Stunt this is the first time that they've had like a like a high profile win on Dynamite in some time. So I like that they're giving them some some time, and they look really really good in this match. There's something there with Jungle Boy and um, Marco Stunt and Luchasaurus, man. I'm telling you right now, they sort of got them doing different stuff. So they had Marco Stunt doing this little rap angle and all that type of stuff, you know, going through, you know, on dark and different things like that. So it's almost like they're trying to give each person individual characterization, and you know, when Luchasaurus himself when they tried to put a little bit of a spotlight on him he got injured right away which sort of deflated the team but it seems like all the wheels are back on the wagon and they're ready to do something here but am i the only one who thinks that these guys just need just a little bit more spice a little bit more edge like you know i know you want to do jungle boy and come out in his loincloth and all this type of stupid stuff but give these guys an edge man you can still call them jungle boy and marco stunt but let's let's edge them up a little bit let's dx them up a little bit i'm telling you there's something there so it looked like Marco Stunt got legit hurt during this match. He and, oh, and boy, the, did he ever. Like, there, there was a full-blown wrestling match going on while the referee wasn't paying attention because he was too busy looking in on Marco Stunt at one point. Yeah, who, like, rolled out and was like, I'm fine. Like, go ref the match. 
So good for him. <laughs> um, I miss the early days of Dynamite during the pandemic where they couldn't get a full crew. So a lot, so they had a lot of the same guys wrestling each other. And for some odd reason, they couldn't get Luchasaurus and they couldn't get Jungle Boy. But you know who they could get? Marco Stunt. And Marco Stunt was having matches with the Murder Hawk. <laughs> and, and I want to link that to... I saw Marco Stunt wrestle on Effie's Big Gay Brunch. Oh, my. A month or so ago. Uh, maybe I, a little bit longer I, 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 I question your viewing choices, but that's okay. So Effie's Big Gay Brunch was absolutely fantastic, <laughs> as I'm sure everyone knows it would be. But um, I bring this up because Marco Stunt was, you know, ended up making like a like a surprise appearance as what did they call him now? It was, um, ah, shit, it wasn't. Damn it, um, Twink. That was a, that's what it was. He he, something along the lines of like 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 the world's greatest Twink. And oh he my. wrestled Effie. Yeah, there, there's a bit where where he also like they, there was there, there were dildos in there. It was a whole thing. Um, <laughs> but there there was a there was a twink battle. Now I remember this. There was a twink gauntlet match, right? So a whole bunch of twinks came out, and and they got beat up by this one large wrestler, uh, indie wrestler. And then Effie, you know, fought like the world's greatest twink, and it ended up being Marco Stunt. And here's what I'm trying to get at: I feel like Dynamite's missing an, an opportunity here. To get him away from the Jurassic Express. They can only bring Marco Stunt down. Whereas Marco Stunt, as you know, like the world's greatest twink, gold, <laughs> and just have him in, and just have him get murdered every week by some wrestler. Oh my God! Forgive this Mark is what I, He knows not what he says. <laughs> this is what I want to see. I want to see Marco Stunt go full blown twink, <laughs> and I, then I want to see him get killed by everyone on the roster one by one, week after week. <laughs> and I, and I think like you start off with like he's got a band aid on, he's got a little owie, and then like he, then like the murder hawk plants him through the mat, like big hole and everything, a la Bam Bam Bigelow and Taz. <laughs> And then the he, next week... He, he would make a very small hole if it was Marco <laughs> Stonto, so that would be even better. You know, and then, like, the next week he comes out and wrestles again, and he wrestles, like, Brian Cage, but this time he's got, like, his wrist drape, uh, taped up, and then R- Brian Cage puts him through the ring, and this is, like, basically treat him like Lana. Um, and so it's just every week somebody murders Marco Stunt, the world's greatest twink. Oh, my God. Until he's wrapped up like... A mummy. What was the wrestler in, in, in the Dungeon of Doom who was wrapped up as the a mummy? Yeti. The Yeti. The Yeti, yes. Basically, until he's in a full body cast wrapped up like the Yeti. <laughs> the Yeti, who was like a, uh, you know, a Canadian snow monster, although the WCW decided that a mummy was just the same thing and called him the Yeti. <laughs> it, so it, it could have been a snow monster wrapped up in those bandages. I don't know. Who knows? Is, who knows? I think this is gold. I think this is what you should do with Marco Stunt. So, so he's not interfering in the in the Jurassic. The Jurassic Express are fine without him. I th- oh, I think so too. I think so too. And not only that, I think AEW thinks the same because after Jurassic Express got the win here, so they pinned poor old, uh, you know, Dark Order number five with their powerbomb move. Marco Stunt was actually given some mic time, and they were cut off cold by one of the coldest teams in WCW, <laughs> the FDR. <laughs> Which, which you know what? When in hindsight, I think they were better off as Alibaba and the Forty Thieves in WWE with their flying carpets. <laughs> but uh, instead, nope, they stayed, and now they're after the Jurassic Express. So they're you know these these teams are headed for a collision. Imagine yep. a nuts and bolts team like uh, you know Brain Busters, you know twenty twenty, are yep. now going to take on the Bushwhackers of of. <laughs> <laughs> 2020. So here you go. <laughs> yep. Somewhere in the next two weeks, we'll have FTR versus the Jurassic Express, which they've already done that match. I'm sure it'll be fine. So um, you know what I like about what I like about FTR and Tully Blanchard is really making is is really carrying their ass. I mean, he's doing the promos for these guys. They're believable. You know, they, they actually set up a. You know, I actually want to see this match. So I mean, you know, Tully Blanchard doing some of his best promo work here at this point. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I- I'm looking forward to to Jurassic Express and FTR because I think FTR, you know, despite all the criticism logged against them, they can pull a great a great match out of pretty well any team. So we'll see. 
it's like Jim Cornette says, if they slow down the other team and teach them, yep. teach them the right way, I think anybody is, FDR is capable of having a four star match with anybody. However, and, if, and, and NXT FTR is for sure. Yeah. Th- those guys are those guys feel like a different team here in AEW. A step off, a step slower. I, I'm not yeah, really sure I, what's I, going on. Hundred percent agree. Like I feel well, not not to again quote Jim Cornette, but Jim Cornette made the observation that FTR I think are just trying to get along, and so they don't want to they don't want to walk in like they're the know it alls, except that they they're the best and they Bingo. should. <laughs> they, yes. they they should be like do what we're doing we and i think it's the the this was the problem with also wcw and the wwe back in the day like guys would come from up north quote unquote and think that they knew everything and then the oh, yeah. you know the wcw locker room would resent them and that would create problems oh you mean when like they gave the uh the us title to hexa jim duggan on basically day 1 that type right. of thing. Hey, ho, tough guy. Here comes the title off Steve Austin. Right. Boom, just like that. Steamroll. And, and it's an ongoing thing in wrestling because people have that problem with Brock Lesnar. You know, you have, you, you know, he wrestles a handful of times a year, but he's the biggest star that they have. And yes. then you have guys in the locker room, you know, like the CM Punks of the world that are just like, hmm, Brock Lesnar, I'm here every day. <laughs> I'm you know well, yeah, I'm wrestling okay. in Topeka, Kansas and shit and you know well, Okay, here's here's the deal. Here's the deal. On a scale of 1 to 10, how upset would you be if somebody came to your workplace and made you a shit ton more money? <laughs> and that's the argument. Think about that for a second. Okay? You without him, you're making a certain amount of money. This guy joins your company. He may take a leapfrog over you. He might you, he might get that position that you've been trying to get for years. But all of a sudden, now you are making money as a direct correlation. Okay, you're making more money off his back without doing any more extra work. It's, it's, it's totally jealousy. It's, it it's, is totally jealousy. It's, yes. it's these guys with small egos, you know, who are butt hurt that they you know they you know they think that because they can do a million flippity doos and run at a hundred miles an hour that they should make a million dollars a match. And it's like, well. Were you UFC champion in a real sport? No. Exactly not. He got Did legitimacy you... behind him. And, and you know what? Nobody's going to take away his wrestling credentials either because, I mean, right. you talk about his time in, uh, you know, Ohio Valley Wrestling. You talk about his early career in WWE. Brock Lesnar has earned his stripes. Nobody is going to take that away from him. And he is and was, you know, the next big thing. And, I mean, every time you see Lesnar on the screen, I'm telling you, I, eyeballs are on that thing, right. and it's a serious, serious game. It's not like seeing Marco Stunt or, you know, uh, Snowman Sting and Darby Allen. It, mm-hmm. It's a different vibe. You know shit is on. It's main event right. time. I have no problem, like, when The Rock comes back or when Brock comes back because no, both of those guys earned every penny that they ever made for the WWE, and if they want to come in and do, like, guest spots, maybe yep. the locker room needs to suck it. The one I have... You're damn right. The the one I can see everyone having a problem with is Goldberg because he was a funk he was a fantasy creation that started to believe he was the real thing and it's like oh dude oh boy I love you Goldberg don't get me wrong but stop just stop Listen, nobody's a bigger fan of Goldberg than Goldberg that's what I'll tell you <laughs> um all right so Alex Marvez caught up to the new Goldberg Kenny Omega and. <laughs> And what Christian <laughs> likes to say is the human Vienna sausage, Don Callis. <laughs> and he, does. Ho- he looks like he he looks like a, a like a little tiny mini penis. <laughs> yeah, he, he he does look like uh, he he's about to have a stroke. Um, <laughs> like, take some blood pressure pills already. Callis complained and, about pop- Al- Alex Marvez. Well, give me a second. I got to sure. talk about Alex Marvez. For oh, a I'm sorry. Go ahead. So. So they are actually like so, so. Alex Marvez was a guy that they had slated for their announce booth first when they started AEW. Okay, <laughs> he was going to be the third guy on the mic. Nobody likes Alex Marvez, so right. all of a sudden he got shoved into. Actually, he got basically taken off TV for a little while, and he just disappeared into the ether. Now he's a guy who's on their payroll that they can't get rid of. So they've got like Dasha Fuentes and all these other girls in the background, you know what I mean, who are great looking to do these, these backstage interviews. But yet the, every single week they got to find something for poor Alex Marvez to do. And boy, did he get the Vienna sausage and the champ here at this one. So there you go. I think it's one of these things that they begrudgingly put on the air. They're like, oh, my God, what are we going to have Alex Marvez do? Here we go. And this is it. <laughs> Cornette refers to him as Officer Barbrady. <laughs> Good 
All right, so Callus complained about Pac making matches for Kenny Omega and demanded Tony Khan take control of his own promotion. Yeah, De- Dynamite desperately needs to have, like, an Arnia commissioner. Oh, I think it's, like, oh, the one thing they yes. are missing. Well, she keeps getting pregnant. Or <laughs> <trying to eat. laughs> So, you know, <laughs> thank you, Brandy Rhodes, but, you know, can we, can we just get an on-air character who doesn't take a penis, please? Can we, can we do that? Omega then talked about Phoenix and recalled that he chokes in all of his recent opportunities in AAA and AEW. That's great. Could we see some footage? Like, yes. I had no idea what yes. the fuck he was talking about. Nope. Sorry, I'm not, a re- I'm not so big a wrestling nerd that I watch every Ricky Ding promotion that's got a pay-per-view going. I'm not rich also, and this shit costs money. <laughs> so Does it? Does it? Oh, oh yes, yes. It costs money. <laughs> yeah. right. Yes, Captain Bailey, it does. Um, <laughs> we can't be all right in the high seas, you know. I'm not sure if that was Irish or pirate. but um, I don't know exactly. I have no idea. But, it was but, Starcher. It was Starcher, I say. Yeah, or Captain Starcher. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he's like referencing a triple A match that nobody saw and they don't have any footage of him. No one knew what the fuck he was talking about. Lost me completely. I didn't even realize he was talking about Phoenix at first. I was like, who? I'm like, oh. I, I, I heard he won the Intercontinental title in Rio, Rio de Janeiro as well on the thing. You know, who knows? Super. Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, and he, so, so, yeah, the gist of this promo was that Phoenix can't win a match. Terrific. Right. I'm going to yep. guess that Phoenix and Omega are wrestling at some point. Yes, coming up very soon. On Dynamite? Because now I don't know. Kenny Omega wrestles everywhere. I'm waiting for him to show up on Raw, so maybe somebody will watch. <laughs> oh, that's a low blow, sir. <laughs> no, so I, it backed up by facts. Um, so uh, he, call, he, he went on and called Phoenix injury prone, blah, 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 blah. Um, he talked about wrestling on Impact, um, <laughs> and this just goes on. No, they're they're actually it's it's Omega and Phoenix coming up on one of their next not pay per view shows, but one of their next uh, Dynamite pay per view shows. Okay, so, so one of the New Year's Dynamite. One, shows. One, yeah, one of the big ones. Yeah, one right, of the cool. uh, televised ones. Yeah, it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be a good match. So uh, take a look at what we got here: Kenny Omega, Don Callister doing the Impact Takeover type of thing, where Omega has you know left the fold and he's doing his own you know invasion sort of backstage sort of. Um, you know, almost like a Vince Russo breaking the fourth wall type of shit. So, you know, now he's coming after Phoenix, which is a a curious title defense when you consider that Phoenix is always injured. So they're basically setting him up for Kenny Omega's this champ who, you know, who picks on mini injury prone guys. So, you know, they're they're trying to, to add to the uh the heel flavor of Kenny Omega here, picking on like a Rey Mysterio type character. All right, so this was followed by Pac versus the Butcher. Um, you know, I like the the Butcher and the Blade as a tag team. I know Jim, Jim Cornette makes fun of them endlessly, and they're kind of job guys for Eddie Kingston. But I like their look. Um, I, I do like too. The, I like the fact that the that the Butcher was actually in a metal band. Um, I think that if they, I think if they like booked them seriously and gave them some good wins, they'd actually be like a really good tag team. They're just they're just kind of stuck in this rut of being goons for Eddie Kingston. Um. Uh, so. Butcher had a good match with Pac. What did you think? I don't like Pac. I, I okay. did like this match, though. I, I'm not a fan of Pac, but man. Did, did you like Pac where, when he was in NXT and he was... I did. Uh, I, li- I loved his little superhero gimmick and he doing his little thing and doing his moves and all this stuff. I think he hasn't been on TV long enough or has a, had had his story consistently long enough for me to care about him in AEW. Like... Where has he come from here? Like, what is? Why is he fighting the butcher and the blade right now? Can you tell me? Be- okay, so I was able to piece this together from okay. the, the the bits of glass that they left <laughs> on the floor and the lollipop <laughs> and the bottle cap. All right, let's hear it. So before the pandemic, Pac and the Lucha Brothers were the Death Triangle. Yes, that's it. That's my answer. Oh my. <laughs> how, but before, how did we get here? How did we get here with hang, the butcher and the blade and the bunny? How? So, uh, well, that's the thing. Like, let me let me go back a step because I, I gotta tell I gotta talk about the Hobbit before we get to Lord of the Rings. So, Pac's gimmick coming into AEW was WWE mistreated me, like everybody. Yeah, what the problem is he shares that gimmick with about half a dozen other guys. Right. So he was pissed off and angry, and he was having uh, really good matches with Kenny Omega and Adam Page. 
and he just was on like a singles run tear and he was like at the you know he was one of their like just under the world title picture headliners then um, he disappeared well then the, the pandemic zone. happened and he got stuck right. wherever the hell he lives so he was off tv for months and now a long time and now the pandemic it, we're in a situation with the pandemic where, where you can still travel and they can get guys in and they've, they're basically up to like their full capacity roster again i don't think there's anybody not you know who's not injured um, you know, that isn't on TV now or you know, right. either on dark or on dynamite. So we're basically back to where we were pre pandemic. And however, during the pandemic, as you'll recall, NWA wasn't functioning. They weren't taping. Right. So a lot of NWA guys started coming, started working in dynamite. That, that's where we got Eddie Kingston from. Uh, uh, what's her face? Rosa. Thunder Rosa. Thunder Rosa. Yeah. Serena Deeb. Um, Ricky Starks, all these guys. Right. And so, if you'll recall, Eddie Kingston walks in and be like, the Lucha Brothers and the Butcher and the Blade, they're all my family. Okay? Now, yes. he's got two, for some weird reason, two tag teams, also two job guys, also two sets of goons surrounding him. Which they yes. kind of did something with, with his feud with John Moxley, and then, they, and then they, they, there's a piece of footage missing. <laughs> <laughs> a big time. And then Pac came back. And the Death Triangle reformed, and now they're in a feud with Eddie Kingston's group. Oh, okay. and and the Murderhawk is, is is in there too. <laughs> Wait a second. So let me try to piece this together. Like I said, the glass pieces are on the floor. So Eddie Kingston group was the Lucha Brothers and the Bunny, the Butcher, and the Blade. Am I correct? Correct. Right. Then the Bunny left and joined the Nightmares, the Nightmare Family. Correct. Yeah, she was banging. So she, she was. She was infiltrating the Nightmare Family as a plot. Yeah, that's what I that's what I that's what I call it when you know when I have relations. I call it infiltrating. <laughs> right. So she was infiltrating. So here we go. So amongst this, while this was happening, then the Lucha Brothers decided they were going to have their own in-house feud with each other while right. still in the Eddie Kingston group. Right. Which brothers, led to them brothers yeah. fight. That's what Kingston right. said. Brothers fight. Which led to them getting back together, then leaving Eddie Kingston's group. Am I correct? Am I still on the right path? Sure. Am I? Or are they still part of that group? No, no, they're, they're the Death Triangle again. Yes, they're the Death Triangle. So they left a group and they rejoined Pac. Right. So now we have... The, so now this is where... Yeah, but there was a piece of that puzzle. <laughs> there, was a, there was a piece of that narrative that, that literally did not exist. <laughs> that I think... I, I don't know. Did Honestly, dark? think I don't of it know. this way. So Eddie Kingston... So... so Pac and the Lucha Brothers are dating, right? Yes. Okay. They're they're kissing. They're holding hands. They're they're at the sock hop. They're sharing a malted. <laughs> I would share a malted with you. That sounds uh, good. Okay. Go ahead. And then Pac and the Lucha Brothers break up, and Pac goes running home. And yes. now the Lucha Brothers are 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 at the sock hop, standing alone. They're stranded at the drive-in. Brand hit a fool. What will they say Monday at school? Don't you understand, Chris Bailey? The Lucha Brothers are standing, crying in the parking lot. Yes. And then alone. along comes a pretty little girl whose name is Eddie Kingston. And Eddie Kingston says, I'm pretty. You should date me. And the Lucha Brothers go, you're right. That's exactly, you're exactly right. So what part of that story does Michael J. Fox play at the sock hop and tell him that, you know, <laughs> you're going to understand this one day? <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I think we missed a piece here, a jump in time. We're, we're definitely okay. missing something. So now, he, so now Eddie Kingston, who's a pretty little girl, has the Lucha Brothers on one arm and the Butcher and the Blade on the other arm, and they're sauntering around, you know, my 1950s grease thing that I've developed. And then Pac walks back, but this time he's wearing leather pants and a black shoulderless top, and his hair's done up. And, 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 and Pac says to the Lucha Brothers, tell me about it, stud. <laughs> and the Lucha Brothers got got chills and multiplied it, <laughs> and they went off with with Pac. You see, this of course this makes complete sense. Thank you, Mark Rabbit. I'm glad I could explain it to you. <laughs> Listen, and that is way more clear than <laughs> AEW made it for us, the, the the viewers, over the course of time with AEW. So half the go. people listening Finally. to this who are familiar with the movie Grease, this you know, like you know, at least got a chortle out of that. The other half completely lost. 
yeah, oh yeah, um, yeah. We we just we just we just lost like half of the five people that listen. So this is <laughs> the two point five that are still there. We hope you enjoy. All right, um, moving right along. The best, the the second best thing on Dynamite right now. Jade Cargill uh, <laughs> oh, did uh, right off a teleprompter and did a did a promo. And she said, Chat called out Cody, and she had called out Brandy, so what's next? Except that Brandy's pregnant. Yep. And, but, and you know what? At least they addressed the elephant in the room. Or, or maybe it's not even an elephant. Nobody cares about the elephant. So, <laughs> But, you know, okay, so you had this Jade Cargill. So she's this jacked-up black lady who has a vendetta against Brandy Rhodes, okay? She wants to bring Shaq into AEW to take on Cody Rhodes and different stuff like that. Now, all of a sudden, you know, part of that puzzle is gone and pregnant, and now we're sort of left at a standstill with poor old Jade Cargill holding the bag. So, you know, she she's still acting the big tough thing, but what are they going to do? Who are they going to pair her with? Does anyone care? You know, will you tune in next week wondering? I certainly won't, but anyway. <laughs> do, you, do, do you have any idea how, how little I care about Shaq in a wrestling ring? <laughs> like, I do not want to see that. Yeah, are we, at, are we still at a point where he matters enough in the culture to where... If he wrestles, first of all, isn't Shaq like sixty years old? Yeah, he got man. He has to be like late fifties at least minimum. He has to be. I don't know, but maybe he can wrestle Sting until one of the until one of their bones <laughs> breaks. <laughs> That's awful. Like why? Why not just right, recycle he's... other celebrities? How about like bring back Alex Trebek? Oh wait, <laughs> <laughs> he's forty eight. I may have missed. Oh. <laughs> well, still though, forty eight and never wrestled. Not counting his thing with the Big Show. Oh my god! The le- and not, not only that. Remember, Shaq showed up with Hulk Hogan in WCW to to lead him to the ring over victory over Ric Flair in the cage. Remember, sure. Shaq was the enforcer. That's right. So he's got history. Um, Hulk Hogan's not racist. He's surrounded by black men. All right, See, um, he is. He is. <laughs> he's he's literally a bill of the Bill Watts of of wrestling right now. That's right. He's, he loves the blacks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's two more people gone. <laughs> we we have, we we have point five of a listener left right now who's not offended. But anyway, let's keep going. Oh, uh, gosh. Back in the ring, Miro, Kip, and Penelope are with Tony Schiavone. Kip said their wedding was going to be a huge deal for everyone. Now, only himself and Penelope are Miro or all of AEW, but for the fans at home as well. <sighs> he claimed to receive fan mail about their wedding. That's a lie. Being the most important event in their lives. Oh, sure. Miro was uh, set to reveal their wedding date, but the video was cut off by the entrance of the best friends. Kip and Miro looked ready for a fight, but it was a practical joke, don't you know? Video was then shown of Trent being loaded into an ambulance. Uh, Orange Cassidy and Chuck got into the ambulance to go with them. Miro and Kip said it was too bad they couldn't be there. Then they announced their wedding date for beach break on... We- okay, so this was an, so all this was just a giant promo for... Giant promo. For the next... After New Year's Bash, the next big branded Dynamite, which yes. you will be... Uh, which we will be reviewing here on TV Party Tonight, myself and Chris Bailey. Ooh. Beach Bash which will be airing uh, February 3rd. Terrific. All right. Are you excited? The wedding, Mark. The wedding. You know, they have a high bar to clear, and that is the bar from the 80s, where on Saturday night's main event, Uncle Elmer got married. If they if they're oh, going to wow. be at least be as good as that one. Who's going to be the Roddy Piper of that group? <laughs> Who's, who's coming out to break up the hillbilly wedding? I want to know. I want to know. And it's going to be that Man. ball of excitement and lightning, that uh, king of personality, <laughs> Orange Cassidy. <laughs> oh, yes. That's exactly what it's So I sent be. you a picture. My kids got me an Orange Cassidy shirt for Christmas. I if, I, if, WrestleMania, if WrestleMania, they can have fans at Raymond James, I'm wearing that shirt to that, to that show. Oh, man. And do, like, the, the lame-ass limp, limp dick thumbs up, too. Oh, if, absolutely. If, you, if you're captured on screen. i got to Every... have that. Every picture, I'm just going to look like, you know, I'm just going to look blank face like, like I've been hypnotized and just give a <laughs> half ass thumbs up. Get some aviators and get the, that audience. The best part of that T-shirt, my wife was telling me that they were in Hot Topic looking for Christmas gifts for me. And my son saw the Orange Cassidy shirt and he's like, it's pockets. It's the guy with the pockets. <laughs> we have to get that for daddy. And I'm like, That's wow, awesome. Jim, Jim Cornette calls him pockets. That's hilarious. <laughs> My son will be starting tennis lessons shortly. Um, that is excellent. 
All right. Uh, Evil Uno versus Dustin Rhodes. Hmm. Meh. Why? Dustin Rhodes. So, boy. Okay, so I think what they're doing here, they're, they're slowly... So, Dustin Rhodes is in an angle. So, it's in with the Dark Order. Now, I don't know what, why they keep bringing around the Dark Order when they seem to have lost their leader and there's like there's no synergy going on. Anyway, they want Dustin Rhodes to join the group and become Seven. Now, anyone who's familiar with WCW remembers that Seven was supposed to be their ominous, almost theatrical, gold dust monster type Uncle Fester uh, gimmick, looking in children's windows, potential pedophile alert. I don't know what was going on there, but anyway, he comes in, he dismisses the angle, saying it's a waste of time, and he becomes the American nightmare Dustin Rhodes, which is basically what he still is right now. So, that's a lot of WCW history. Moving forward, they fight Evil Uno. And he wins. So Dustin Rhodes with another win. And boy, he gets on those ropes and he says, no seven. He ain't being a seven. So is this over? Do we get more mystery and intrigue with the Dark Order? Are you that excited to find out the continuing saga of when seven? Do, when does the, Dark, the Order? Dark Order ever win matches? On Dark? In the Dark? Yeah, they they win. They win a few matches. Yeah, they, they're okay. actually pretty decent on Dark. So, you know, okay. they, they have at least half and half going on there. All right, so like dynamite's their kryptonite, though. Like they can only no, win on dark. They, they do not win when the window matters. No, when Rattledge is watching, the dark order <laughs> is losing. <laughs> All right, um, moving on. There's a there's a bit that happened after the match. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody gives <laughs> God. Nobody cares about this angle. Um, however, everyone cares about the chairman of the board, Sean Spears. Ooh, and he gives a promo that is a year late. He's, One of these glass ceiling promos where he's being held down by the man, Tony yeah, he Khan. Said, he said, I left New York. I was looking for opportunities that never came. Okay, he had a he, he had a halfway decent run on SmackDown, didn't he? He did. Well, no, 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 no. Yeah, well, it started out halfway decent, and then it literally just stalled, and he was like the guy counting ten and doing nothing. Like, it literally, he dissolved into nothingness. Like, he literally disappeared off the, off the map. He started out strong, almost had, like, a Chris Jericho-esque return, you know, at the Royal Rumble, and then he debuted on SmackDown. And, you know, he looked great for about three weeks, and then it just went shh, air out of the tires. So he complained that he he didn't get a push in the WWE, except that he kind of did. And then right. he was like, so I'll come to AEW, where I'm friends with Cody Rhodes, and get a push here, but I'm, but I'm still losing matches and not getting TV time. So he's... So, this was a lot of him being, you know, like angrily crying that nobody loves him. Yes. He, <sighs> he, he's, he's, he's stuck on the glass ceiling, Mark. Can't you? He can't break through, Mark. Can't you see? Can't you see? Can't Boy, you this see? angle hasn't been done before. <laughs> can't you see? Sorry. Um, <laughs> what you do to me? All right. Anyway, uh, Tony was right. like, maybe the problem is you. And he pulled up his he hiked up his skirt and ran away. Um, this, so that was the end this, of that. If Vince McMahon was re writing this, he would have wrote this exactly the same way and meant it. He would have said exactly right to his face, don't you think that the problem is not the writing, but it's you? And he would have fucking meant it. And then he would have dumped <laughs> him in the garbage can. He <laughs> or he would have pulled down his pants and made him, you know, lick his taint. <laughs> I love it. Uh, speaking of licking taint, Dasha interviewed Hikaru Shida backstage. She asks about Abaddon, who apparently is, Ooh. like, three feet tall and fat. Um, and then Abaddon immediately showed up and assaulted Sheeta. But um, waited. There's this awkward pause where where poor old um, uh, Mulan was waiting in the lurch here. <laughs> and and uh, Abaddon was supposed to attack her, but they went silent for a minute. And then Abaddon came in and attacked. And it was the weirdest thing in the world. If you have not seen Abaddon... Picture Marilyn Manson, 500 pounds heavier, and about 40, 40 years like out of his element. And that's okay. what Abaddon looks like in female versions. So go to, if your mall is still open, depending on where you live in the United States, I know that we're in the re middle of retail apocalypse, um, and, and le there are malls closing left and right. But if you have a mall that's open, you probably have a hot topic. The fat cashier with the, with the septum ring, that's Abaddon. <laughs> Bingo! And another listener lost. Um, <laughs> Man, the point five. Now it's just us listening to each other. This is where it gets good. This is this is fine with me. Um, 
All right, uh, Sheeta. How come, you're... how come Alex Marvez didn't do this interview? Oh, I know why. He used up his two minutes that they allowed him every week. There you go. Continue oh, they also, on. they probably don't want like you know like any kind of like se- sexual harassment. God only knows. <laughs> <This> is... <laughs> Ooh, pretty girl. Stop it, Alex. <laughs> Uh, all right, okay, Hikaru so, Shida yeah. versus Alex Garcia. Take it away, Bailey. Oh, boy, what a match we had here. So the whole idea behind this was that Hikaru Shida got, you know, basically beaten two seconds before her match, managed to survive the beating from Abaddon, came out, and had a little bit of a more aggressive challenge than I would have thought from Alex Gress- uh, What is it? Gracia? Gracia. I guess that's what it is. It's, it was a non-title match either way. Anyway... Sheeta had a bit of a devil of a time. Abaddon is now at ringside, waiting, you know, waiting on the champion, distracting her. But we got to see a little bit of a more aggressive side of of Sheeta here. You know, she's really, really getting more aggressive. But she's getting aggressive because she's getting ready for the monster Abaddon, you see? You see, this is what's happening. So, you know, these girls had a pretty decent match. I mean, we saw a lot of, like, suplexes. We saw a lot of really, really strong, strong style, style, you know, forearms and different things like that. So she'd ended up winning with the Falcon Arrow, as she normally does. And then Abaddon comes out of the crowd. But Sheeta kills her immediately with the kendo stick. Like, immediately. Like, wails away at her, and she goes dead, limp in the corner. So... While she's in the corner, she has the, the the Singapore cane. Now, she's tapping her, you know, trying to see if she's still alive. Then Abaddon, of course, strikes and bites her violently in the neck. And literally, blood is pouring all over poor Mulan here. And we fear that the monster has eaten her while they pull Abaddon, the crazy fat Marilyn Manson clone, to the back room. That's the match. There you go. You're welcome. Terrific. Um, moving on. She She did a really poor job, so you could tell... Sheeta had a blood capsule in her hand, and she couldn't really get it to blow up, so she had to keep squeezing it and throttling it to get the blood out. It's pretty funny. They had a pretty close-up shot of it, so keep a, keep an eye on that. That that's for you, uh, the, the the other guy that's listening. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I I'm gonna go ahead and say that I like the acclaimed. Me um, too. So I they l- had a rap song like early on. And, and this is what, remember when you were talking about Top Flight, how I wanted them to have like an, a saucy edge, like a razor edge? That's the acclaimed. Man, yeah, the acclaimed have it all. Go ahead. I'd, I'd love to hear your view on them. No, I, I uh, the, the acclaimed look like grown men. The, yep. uh, you know, like I, the thing about the NWO back in the 90s was that Kevin Nash took great pains to try to make the group hip. Like they weren't just, like at first they were just beating the shit out of people and like, you know, throwing Rey Mysterio into into the trailer and hitting people with bats and spray painting them. They were just vicious. Yep. You know, and then they kind of evolved slowly, um, slowly but surely into, like, a bunch of white rappers, but cool. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, they had an edge to them. And they, 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 they were... They were as much a part of the culture as the culture was a part of them, if you know what I mean. And that's why exactly. people... I think glommed onto the NWO and like people were cheering them and wanted to buy their merchandise. The, the NWO were cool. And so when I see the acclaimed, like rap is such a, such a touchy thing to do, especially on wrestling because it tends to come off like, and this was already referenced by Frankie Kazarian. It, you come off like men on a mission. You come off like, <laughs> like this, <laughs> you know, a lot of rap tend, especially when white people are involved, tends to come off lame. And the acclaimed, have a viciousness about them. They yep. set, they look and sound like men, and their rap seems authentic. So I'm like, they to me, they hit the three legs of the stool to prop up this, you know, where rap, where we're rapping wrestlers gimmick. And yeah, they, they, they gave the young bucks a good edge. beating for their troubles. I, I'm surprised that they let the young bucks go over here so so clean because I mean they've been clocking up win after win after win on dark. Mm-hmm. And, man, they have an edge. They've got, like, a saucy rap gimmick going on there. And I think the fans are invested in them. If if I'm picking a group for, like, an Eddie Kingston, this is the type of – these are the type of guys you want as your backbone, you know what I mean? Because these, these guys are future talent. So I know we got Top Flight. We got the Acclaim. We got a whole collection of these up-and-comers that I think that NXT – uh, you know, would would love to have. Can you imagine if they took the Jurassic Express, the Acclaimed, and even Top Flight over in NXT, what they could do? I mean, these guys, I think the Acclaimed will be 
top flight superstars. Like literally, I think I think they have a future ahead of them because I, I think we're witnessing a lot of young talent on the uprise here, and AEW has the most of it. So too bad that they lost, but I don't think they really lost anything because I mean you're putting them against the young bucks and they more than held their own. They're very aggressive. They look great in the ring. And like you said, they're grown ass men, and they look tough, and that's that's the part of the puzzle, man. I love them, love these guys. Yeah, I um, I would say of a lot of the, t- I mean, a lot of the tag teams in Dynamite have been around for a while. We've seen, you know, that that was, and that's the unfortunate side effect of the pandemic on this company is a lot of them wrestled each other a lot. Yeah, and they and like the most excitement was when FTR showed up, but they. You know that basically blew up on the launch pad. They didn't use FTR right, and that fizzled out quickly. And then you know they lost their meaningless tag team titles. So right now, the only tag team currently in Dynamite that I'm interested in, and and, and like they show up on screen, and I'm like, ooh, what are they going to do? What are they going to say? Is the acclaimed? And yep, that took two weeks. Fucking two I, I, weeks, I, Bailey. Two I want- weeks. It took them to get the to get me cynical, makes fun of everything, rattledge into the acclaimed. Yeah, and man, they won me over. Like you know what? Immediately out of the gate, there's something there. Immediately, and they actually have matching ring attire. Imagine that. They actually have like their colors match up. It's a different style. Like one wears shorts, one wear pants, but they match up the colors. They actually have a gimmick. They're together. You know what I mean? There's something in tag team wrestling. AEW has sort of figured it out. They just got to do a better job storyline wise. But tag team wrestling is on the uptick. And I think AEW has a ton of that talent here. And the acclaimed, I can't wait to see what the future brings with these guys. Loved it. And yeah. it was a good way to cap off the show. Yeah, I, thought they, I actually thought they had a good match. I mean, it was a Young Bucks match. It's it's <sighs> Brian Last, who who Jim Cornette podcasts with. Um, he has his own series of podcasts, about, about 100 of them um, that he does. But he, uh, you know, Cornette was doing his usual complaining about the type of high speed, high impact wrestling that is commonplace. And Brian Lass was like, you, at this point, then don't watch wrestling because that's all it is, you know. And he and he used a phrase, "coin of the realm," you know. <laughs> and he's right, you know. The the, the I can't, I don't want to complain too much. This is why we, you know, like we gave such high marks to Full Gear and Jim Cornette trashed it because I've kind of accepted the the type of wrestling I'm going to see. And so at as long as like they're not missing each other, you know, and it's not a thousand and one dives, you know, and, and they're, they're just kicking out of every finisher in the history of pro wrestling. Like they actually have a match where people are selling. I mean, the, the bucks and, and this, this is true. Like Jim Jordan kind of refers to them as like the three feet tall road warriors. They kind of sell like that. Nothing hurts them. <laughs> but beyond that, I thought they had a good solid wrestling match here. Like I was into this match. Me too. And, they, man, they were doing a lot of, like, the Acclaimed has it all. So they, they can do power moves. They can do flip. They, like, they can do the flippity-doos. They can do a lot of it. And you know what? I think a little bit of the thing here is that they actually outshone the Young Bucks. I think they added a little bit. You know, I think I think they leveled them up. And mm-hmm. that's something that a lot of new teams you don't see. And But there's something with these guys, man. I'm telling you now. There's something there. My only complaint, and this is a general complaint about dynamite and storytelling, and it's sort of if, like if there's one central theme of this entire review, it's that that storytelling is not AEW's strong suit. Um, they either they either lose the plot threads and they yes. just and so the stories don't make any sense, or there's no chase. The chase is duck duck goose. It's just right. short circle, and then you're done. And so the acclaim chased the young bucks in a in a sh- in a really short circle, and then it's over. Where like the acclaimed should have, you should we should have seen at least a month or two of the acclaimed getting good wins on dynamite, and then like interfering in bucks matches. If not during the match, causing DQs, then after the match, throwing beatdowns, and then demanding the young bucks respect them and give them a title match, and the young bucks like fucking earn it. You you got here yesterday earn well you know they haven't even had a return match with ftr well they claim to be, have been uh eight wins and oh so a lot of those happened on dark of course okay if it but, happened on uh, dark it didn't happen right yeah and, and i agree <laughs> and i agree but you know what 
the strength of WWE with every single feud they have is that they have a sensical chronological video package that goes into each one right. of these matches. You know what I mean? That's what's missing with AEW. Like, connect us. Put the pieces together. If, if you want us to talk about what happened on Dark, show us. Because right. a lot of people didn't watch it. Ma- so I don't, give us yeah, I'm not going to ever watch Dark unless I'm bored at work. Right. Um, and the last time I tried, unless I was bored at work and tried to watch something, it was Glory 76, and I, and, you know, couldn't watch it because a million people needed to be put on suicide watch on that particular day. <laughs> Were you that, wearing your scrubs at that point? I was wearing my scrubs, yes. So so I want to talk about this. I think that uh, I always pictured Mark Radlich, and I, I told him this off air, that he always wore a chips uniform <laughs> with the aviators on a bike with a baton. I thought that's how he went to work and he disappointed me. He told him that he, that he worked in scrubs. Now I have a totally different like now and now I've got like a Grey's Anatomy vibe about you. I think you're you're banging dudes in the back room. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I don't, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> how do we get here? How do we get here? It's AEW storytelling all over again. <laughs> Um, See, there was no video package, Mark. See, I was going to be like, you know, first of all, if you're going to do that joke, you, you know, she was like, I'm thinking about Oz, and you're banging guys in the backyard. Then I wouldn't have questioned it. But um, <laughs> you, know, you know what I always wondered. All right, moving on. Um, so, uh, yeah, overall, this was sort of thumbs in the middle for me. Um, I was going to say, like, to your point, and I think it's a valid one, one that I support, do less of the pointless interviews where everyone interrupts each other and children run off giant men and do more video packages. Because that's the one thing about the WWE that I never complain about. It works against them because people like me don't watch Raw and SmackDown thinking, I'll just watch the kickoff show and I'll watch the packages and I'm all caught up. And that way I don't see... Oscar versus the same girl a hundred times in a row, right. um, you know, or the Hurt Business versus the New Day a hundred times in a row. Um, but at least if I had gotten a pack, <laughs> yeah, I'm the, sick of all this worn out leather. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, if I had gotten a package of the acclaimed wiping, the, you know, wiping their feet with their competition on AEW Dark, then I would have been like, oh, okay, I get it. They they have worked their way up. Here's the problem. You, you, if you're doing matches on Sunday Night Heat, you still need to do more matches on Raw Bingo. to get that title shot. Don't doing... assume your audience listens to, you know, li- li- watches, I should say, in this case, Dark. Don't assume that anyone watches any other content. You know what I mean? You, you can't do that. Well, that's like because... the biggest criticism of AEW is they think that every single one of their fans is, a, is some, you know, incel loser wrestling fan. That's all they ever do. I, you know, I, look, I, I watch Mark, other Mark, stuff. I, I, I watch every show. Yeah, I mean, am I in, in <laughs> you're married, though, and have... Gr- <laughs> but you're married and have grown kids and a job. You're fine. Um, you're, you're, you're allowed to have your obsessions, I suppose. But, um, but in all seriousness, like, not everybody watches every single wrestling show. Like, I'm oh. annoyed. Like, the one thing, as, as exciting as it is, and is like, as much as it kind of gets me back into watching wrestling again... I'm annoyed I have to watch Impact now because of Kenny Omega. <laughs> there, you can watch it on YouTube and like fast forward. It's it's really it, there's a there's an Impact recap show where you you get exactly the highlights you need. So there you go. Oh, perfect. I'll, I'll give you the cheat sheet. <laughs> Thank you. I pre- I appreciate your cliff notes to Impact version because <laughs> right now it's sitting on my DVR and I ugh, I don't I don't have the strength. <laughs> um but yeah, uh, some good matches, some blah matches. Like here, the, okay, this is my 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 summation, and then we can. I swear to God, we can get to the end of this. They called it Holiday Bash because it's Christmas time, and they wanted you know, and because it was airing at ten o'clock, and they wanted you know people to, you know, we promise you there'll be interesting things. We're giving it a special name. Like Winter is Coming felt like a pay per view. This yes. felt like an episode of Dynamite. This and should I, have been. This literally should have not been redubbed because I think that yeah. leaves a bad taste in people when you rebrand your show. And, and th- this was literally, I think, maybe even this was an episode of Dark. There was nothing here, like with the exception of the acclaimed and that match with the Young Bucks. All of these matches should not have been on TV. No way. Okay. Like I like talking wrestling with you, so I'll talk about anything. But this didn't feel this. This is why I didn't want to do a weekly Dynamite recap show. Or an NXT one, which the NXT at least had this good sense to not brand their show this week, this past. Yes, because it was exactly. just an episode. Of, it was just a fucking episode of NXT. Who gives a shit? 
It's you okay know, to have just an episode of NXT or an episode of Dynamite. It's okay. They you got to build towards these branded specials. They didn't even make use of the fact that it's Christmas. Like with the Winter is Coming thing, they brought out Sting and they, you know, and they used special graphics and there were special posters. Like the graphic I'm going to use for this is a picture of the Young Bucks and the Acclaimed that was used to advertise the show, but it's not like if you catch my meaning, it's not a, it's not a poster of the event. Right, exactly. Like, yes. Like you would for full gear or double or nothing or whatever. It's you know it's it's just like their weekly like television sh- picture that they would show of any match on the show. Right. It's it. There's nothing special about it, and it it felt that way. If this was my Christmas gift from AEW, I'm sending it back. I'm re-gifting it. I I, I wish I almost wish they had done like silly skits or something or something like I like if you didn't know that it was Christmas time, you wouldn't have known that this was their Christmas episode. No, exactly. You're exactly right. You're 100 percent right. This is. You know, this this is everything that Christian thinks that AEW is. They should have had <laughs> Kenny Omega give a um, V trigger to Santa Claus. This is you're, honest to God. That was that's what was missing. You needed some holiday flair, and you needed somebody mm-hmm. disposing of Santa. That would have been amazing. And the human Vienna sausage, you know, ringing them on and putting on the uh, the beard, the whole nine yards. That would have been great. You know. Or like Santa comes out and he's just give, and he's just like ho 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 it's AEW everyone gets a title and he's like giving a title to Marco Stunt and you know, he's got like belts for everybody and like Cody comes out and just fucking hits him with the weight belt get out of here Santa <laughs> they can't all have titles all right you know what they, if AEW brought Santa in they would have made him a member of the Dark Order and called him twenty five for December twenty fifth that's exactly what they would have done you know with what Santa. instead of giving Jade Cargill a hostage letter to read on air what they should have had. <laughs> <laughs> what they should have had is had Santa come out, cut a promo, and had Jade Cargill just like like come out and beat the shit out of him. That would have been awesome. I would have, I would have. This whole review would have been different if Jade Cargill had beaten up Santa. Oh, that would have been so good. That, that you you just hit it right there. See AEW if you're listening next week. So you've got Father Time with with New Year's Day. Get rid of, <laughs> have, have Jade Cargill kill 2020. That's what we need. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> you know what's happening now. We just willed it into the universe. That's right. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. <laughs> anyway, All right. That's, that's our that's our review. Um, that's, my, that's my call, as they say. <laughs> Next week, we've got Wonder Woman come back to me. We've got Double Damn You Hollywoods, one for Soul and one for Wonder Woman 1984. We've got our end of the year show on the Metal Hammer of Doom. Uh, we're going to review the live from the Doom Saloon 3 clutch show plus talk about our previous uh, year full of our, our favorite tracks from this year's previous reviews um, and that's it for that week We what we've got in the can is our Warrior Christmas special the holiday cheer for the whole family really well, that uh, is amazing yes <laughs> if, you, if you're not full of distrucity you will be after this the uh, review of Monster Hunter t- uh, Tables, Ladders and Chairs uh, we did our last album review of the year. We did a Majestica, a Christmas Carol. So that's all in the archives, along with all of our other great shows. Chris, do your Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey. Do your plugs and take us home, baby doll. Oh man, you can find me on Parlor. That's right, Parlor. No, nobody goes there. You you won't find me there. You probably will, but I won't be there. Anyway, <laughs> you can find me actually on Twitter at Charlton underscore Hero. Where you find all my uh, all my ramblings and uh, you know Kurt Cameron hate. You'll find all that stuff right there. So How as you well, you'll Kurt find Cameron? me over here. Didn't you hear about that guy? He's an anti-masker now, and he's found Jesus over and over and over again. So well, I knew that he yeah. found Jesus, but I wasn't aware that he was an anti-masker. Okay, go oh, on. Oh, he he led a giant, and I mean giant, congregation of anti-maskers do a rally during the COVID era. So you know what, Kirk Cameron, you can you can you know what you can do. Well, it's, easy <laughs> anyway. an, it's easy to be an anti-masker when you're rich and don't have to be around people. There you go. How come it's Candace? Good. How come we can't have more Candace Cameron Bure? She's, she's a lot more attractive, and I love that woman. There you go. There you go. How about that? There you go. That's that's all I got to say. Fuller House. Watch it. Watch that. That's what I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah. It took me a minute to realize who you were talking about. Oh, my God. She is hotsy totsy even for a middle-aged yes. woman. Indeed she is. And listen, listen, I'm going to be here doing doing shows with Mark Radlich until Michelle Tanner shows up at the, at the uh, Tanner house, and then I'm leaving. Then I'm off this network, okay? Yeah, well, that, that, there's no be- better way to go out with them than with the uh, with, with the. Uh, Tanner girls there. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, that's it for me. Merry Christmas, my man. And right. happy 
Flippin' New Year to yep. everybody. I'm going to bumble stumble my way out of here. For Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, I'm Mark Radledge. Be well, be safe, and behave. 